And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Geek Watch, a subsidiary of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two of my good brothers here in our temple. We have the man guiding you through all, through all of your VTubers, and the and the man who is prob is probably blue from set from Papyrus, the great Papyrus. Good brother Shades, <laughs> and, and we have the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadari Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence. Good brother Xanatrix. It is, it, it is April seventeenth. It is Easter. I, once an, once again, it's another year where the Easter Bunny has managed to evade me shooting at him. You need to really practice your aim. <laughs> well, to be to be fair, my, to be fair, I um I decided to up my game and I was shooting at him with a Maduce. I you know, he's taking lessons from another from a certain other bunny. Mm -hmm. You know, monk Maduce are not meant for sniping or accurate precision fire. They're meant for cover fire. I didn't know if he had. Well, I had I was having the philosophy of. I've got a bullet with your name on it, and I'm going to keep firing until I find it. <laughs> Good philosophy. Bad execution. Um, yeah. No, what? No, what I need it. What I need is um, explosives. I mean, I I know a guy. <laughs> his uh, his name may start with a letter of the alphabet. Oh, uh, <laughs> like. If I can get the, if I can get, I think what we need the holy hand grenade of Antioch, <laughs> or or just or just find a, or just find a few, a few grenades and have them appropriately blessed. <sighs> which is why which is why it's a good thing that monks sometimes have to do double duty as priests. <laughs> it's also a good thing that that uh. I am an ordained Dudist priest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is that is not the focus of the of the week. And to be fair, I th I think my family is learning when it comes to what they give what they give me for Easter. AKA Your family can chocolate. learn. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I think it's penance for the fact that I kept stealing other people's eggs and rehiding them. In high places. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not allowed on Easter egg hunts. Nah. <laughs> I mean, you could have gone one better and hid them up in trees. Bold of you to think I didn't. Bold of you to think that I didn't think that. <laughs> um, I think in one case I hid them up in trees and then I duct taped them to the tree. That way they don't fall out. Yeah, and then I came back. A, I came back a few days later, and they were still there. Because <laughs> what were they going to do? Ask me to help out? They didn't want to give me. They didn't want to give me the satisfaction. Regal. But that's uh, that's rails, monk. Yeah, that's rails. Get. So as you can, as you can see, this week around the focus is the consistent nostalgia of Ultraman, and this is this is going to be an interesting one for us because this will be the first time we've talked about Ultraman since we did the Togusats to Tabletop episode many months ago. Oh yeah, and for the record, I do still maintain what I said on that one. Of the of the big four tokus of the big four tokusats, Ultraman and Garo would be the easiest to adapt into tabletop form. For sure the same can... reason. I'm not sure you can call Garo a big though. Garo's always been kind of niche. Yeah. Comp you st you stack that up with some of the, with some of the more obscure entries and the fact that those are the four that are still getting. Pro that are still that are still getting projects on a somewhat regular basis. Okay, I see. I see. I see your your justification, and I understand what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
It's one of those cases where it's debatable, but fair. <laughs> yeah. So, Monk, am I going to have to do the preamble again? <laughs> um, I think I'm almost obligated to, give, given that this is your turf. Well, secondary turf. <laughs> but we don't have Easy Rider here, so yeah, this kind of has to be my territory. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Ultraman, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So this is the oldest of the big four tokusats out there. Because this came out, literally came back came out in 1966, mm -hmm. was the first iteration of this Ultra Q, with the first official Ultraman coming out roughly around the same year. Mm -hmm. Developed by legendary special effects mastermind, A.G. Tsuburaya. And to qualify that, this was one of the guys who co-created Godzilla. Mm -hmm. So... To say he's an expert on the top on the subject would be an understatement. <laughs> it's his, it's his, I'd say the, the only other the only other case of as OG as it gets would be if a Cube. Yeah, I I would say that you know worked on the original Godzilla makes him one of the grandfathers of Toku. Mm -hmm. Actually, he was given the nickname the Father of Tokusat. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that kind of holds. Huh. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's like I know something. Hmm. <laughs> well, I don't think we, we've questioned many things about you, Zan. Your intelligence and your knowledge is not usually one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I should hope not, except when I'm being a doofus. But that's you know by choice. Yeah. But yes, the 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 Ultra series has been going on for decades upon decades, far even longer than those like Common Rider and Sentai, and it has been one of the more one of the few series that has actually gained at least a modicum of uh, notice, even in the States, with stuff like Ultraman Towards the Future, and even an attempt at dubbing a certain Ultraman series back in the uh, early back in the mid, early to mid two thousands. Though uh, we don't talk about that one really. <laughs> we we will have to, we will have to rip that band aid off, but I want to save that for later. Yes, yes, yes. I'm yes. talk about what now? <laughs> exactly. Oh. But regardless, that, that kind of success, but the one of the ring reasons why we're doing this episode tonight is that unlike stuff like Kamen Rider and Sentai, where every season tends to be drastically different from the last, you know, there there are consistent elements, but there are the like a lot of it is very different. Ultraman has a level of consistency in its care in, in its hero designs and it's a lot of its story elements, a lot of its story beats even to this day, are very similar to each other. Plus, it has an overarching lore, an overarching lore that, while has had alternate universe stuff, especially in the Heisei era, has been relatively maintained even to this day, which is honestly kind of impressive. But it also does mean that there are times where you can look at two Ultraman and you could have a hard time telling the two apart unless you really can look at the finer details. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There have been many times where I've tried to look up an Ultraman online and I honestly wasn't sure which one was the one I was looking for because they looked exactly the same. I'd say, I'd say this was especially the case with a lot of the Showa era Ultraman. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, sure, there's stuff like Taro with the giant horns. Kind of hard to miss that. But, like, trying to tell the difference between Ultraman and Ultraman 80, good fucking luck. Mm hmm And the th of and that's that's not even getting into some some of the ones that are meant to be oh, that are meant to be callbacks, which is going to happen when you have a, when you have a series with a rich lineage. Um, now I do want to make one caveat for tonight, and this is something I this is something I made clear to sh to Shades and to and to Zan, and I think I need to repeat it here. We will not be discussing the Netflix Ultraman series, the an the animated one. For those mm -hmm. who are wondering what we're referring to, and the uh, reason it, for that is that is a whole different set of circumstances that demands its own approach. Yeah. However, what we will say, at least what I will say, is it's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I reviewed the first season. I thought it was really good. 
But mm-hmm. we should at least bring up one of the com- one of the biggest aspects of the lore of like what what the Ultra Men are, mm-hmm. what the Ultras the, are. The Giants are, of Light. The Giants of Light. They are an alien species from a land, from a world known as the Land of Light, who either possess or take the form of humans. And act as basically guardians of the universe. They defend the universe from all sorts of evil aliens from across the ga- from across the many universe uh, across the universe. And when they come to Earth, yeah, like I said, they either possess or take the form of a human in order to basically watch over things and make sure evil don't get uh, evil aliens don't decide to come over and uh, invade, mm-hmm. which happens quite a lot, especially in Japan. It's uh, a little t- scary how frequent that happens. Yeah. The Land of Light, or which is only said to be located in a place called Nebula M78. Yeah. But due to that origin, and because they are beings made of energy, we get probably one of the most uh, identifiable tropes in Ultraman, and one that actually spread throughout Toku a bit, the Timer. The color timer. The, the color timer. Basically, in some sense, the ultra ultras are invincible. Like they cannot be killed directly, but because they are made of light energy, they tend to have a limit of how long they can be active outside of the land of light. So when they are when they're when they are trying to fight, they have a limit to how much energy they can use. And when their energy starts running low, they usually will have a jewel somewhere on their body, usually on the chest. That starts blinking and beeping, much like a video game, to let you know that yeah, they're uh, running low on steam. Mm-hmm. It, it. This can be said to be more of a, a way to ramp up the drama really easily in a Toku show, especially back in the day. Mm-hmm. Um, makes sense that it exists, but yeah, I believe one. It's... Sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that it was artificial tension. Like you know, yeah. it's artificial, but because of how consistent it is, something we're going to be you're, the word you're going to be hearing a lot tonight. Because of how consistent it is, it becomes less of an annoying annoyance and more of an. Oh well, yeah, that makes sense. It's about that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, the common rule was three minutes, wasn't it? Three minute yeah. color timer. Yeah, usually. And I I'd, I'd like to think that. Because of how much of an influence Ultraman it, Ultraman is across the decades, that that's what influenced the ninety nine point nine seconds that we saw when we talked about Garo. Oh yeah, or, there's no doubt that's an influence. Yeah, and of course, then there's um, other other Toku series that take very heavy inspiration from uh, from Ultraman. The probably the most uh, known one now because of some very good trigger works would be Gridman. Mm-hmm. He oh, has a, he has a timer and his entire design is super reminiscent of an Ultraman. Well, to be <laughs> fair, to be fair, same production company. I know. Yeah, it, I know. It's a Super Mario production, and it was. It's often seen as kind of a spinoff of the Ultra series because it has a lot of the same elements, even if it's not directly tied to the Ultra series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and um, but with that, you know, we we got Quad S dot Gridman, which is a spin off, technically a spin off of a spin off, um, because of how good that also was. And so, as you can see, Ultra has a far-reaching set of influence due to these consistent elements. Yeah. Now, the odd man the odd man out when it comes to the, when it comes to the consistency oddly enough is Ultra Q. And there is a, there, and there is a bit of a reason for that. While while Ultra Q is responsible for the first appearances of a lot of the kaiju designs that would be that would become staples over the years. Um, Ultra Q can be best described as a, as a Japanese attempt at the Twilight Zone, and yeah. this is what this is. This goes into why I said why I said that. Ult, that for the most part, 
the Ultra Series makes a better role makes a better role playing um, foundation because unlike certain series where you never know if you're going to be getting something fantasy, something SF, or something in between, Ultraman has lit, has put itself squarely in the midst of in, in the realm of pulp science fiction, even having a science team almost every series. Yeah, almost every Ultra series involves some kind of uh, uh, quasi-militaristic science team that have, you know, they'll have ships and, you know, planes and, and all kinds of weaponry, but they're not main, they're not considered a military force, more a defense force at best. Mm -hmm. And they're Especially usually... Like Ultra 7. Yeah. And they're, and they're usually people who have a close association with the ultra in human disguise or the human possessed possessed by an ultra depending mm -hmm. on which series and you're looking at rare, and very rarely do they actually know that they have an ultraman in their midst yeah it's hidden very well that person is usually like a family member of someone who's on the staff or might be like a security guard or something along those lines and nobody suspects that they're actually the ultraman in disguise mm-hmm Kind of Superman-y that way, except it's much easier to 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 to, uh, to disguise yourself when your normal form is, you know, a fifty meter tall giant that shoots laser beams out of his arms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the spacium beam. Oh man. Yeah, there, there's a lot of things that no matter what season you're dealing with, you're gonna see the uh, certain common elements, the the, the similar designs. Almost every one of them has a form of the spacium beam, which is, you know, one arm across, one arm straight up, beam coming out the up arm. You know, something to that effect, even though there's there are variations, but generally that's the look you get. Mm -hmm. the, it, the, in fact, uh, the way that the spacium beam looks is so iconic that in the fan song about Ultraman 7, Omoide wa Oxen Men, set to the theme of Wiley's Castle 2, um, says, my arms in the shape of an L as part of the lyrics. Mm -hmm. Because and the most common, I guess, would be the wrist against the base of the elbow while the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the left hand against the base of the elbow on the right hand while the right hand is upright. And yeah, when it comes to that, when it comes to that consistency, something else I do, something else I do think is, wor is worth noting, is um, if you look at a lot of ep if you look at a lot of episode structures, the fo there's a whole lot more focus on, on on uncovering uncovering mysteries of the week rather more more so than uncovering monsters of the week. Yeah, the, the the monster is not the driving force. They're the climactic uh, obstacle to overcome in order to determine the solution to the mystery. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Which, that is, I'd say, a lot of that is rooted in the fact th that the that the U the support team in a given series is tip is typically is typically based more in the more in the realm of science than than militarism yeah yeah i mean again there are exceptions ultra 7 was more of a defense force than it was a science team but it still fit a lot of the social qualifications mm -hmm. well i mean again as we boiled it down to paramilitary science team essentially yeah, yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say i'd say this particular thing is a but is a by is a byproduct of the work that Subaraya was do was doing when it came to um, Godzilla. Yeah, kaiju films, which also had a lot of their own science mi science teams actually inside the military. Yeah, and yeah, well, and, and... Godzilla has always had an underlying theme of the line between science and ethics. Yeah, yeah, and also Ultra Q. Going back to Ultra Q. A lot of what Ultra Q created kind of helped set the blueprints for what Ultra Man would become, in terms of it being, you know, it, like we said, it was kind of it's a, a kaiju uh, Twilight Zone. You kind of still see that vibe even today with Ultraman, mm -hmm. as they keep kind of doing that kind of thing, big mystery, 
uh, you know, while it's it's a little less these days, the these days they've kind of dabbled more into standard monster of the week kind of shit that common rider in them would do. They don't they don't make it as big of a thing as what Toei does. Mm-hmm. So it's it kind of walks a good balance between the two. And between 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 um between Ultraman, Kamen Rider, and Super Sentai, would it be f- would it be fair of me to say that Ultraman explored the, explored form changing the at the the last? Hmm. That's a I mean, what's what's the earliest form of form changing you can think of with KR? The earliest form would have to have been Black RX. Oh, yeah. If I want to get really pedantic, it would be the charge-up version and stronger, but that would be the first upgrade form. The first utility sense that we're, that we're all familiar with would be Black RX, and the first and the format would later be per, would be more or less perfected with Kuga. So at mm-hmm. yeah. most, I'd say eighty-eight. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think Ultraman really did form changes. I'm trying to think if it did it if it did it at any point before Tiga. Yeah, I don't think it did. I I don't think so. Let me let me check the Ultraman wiki. I'm already on it right now. Mm -hmm. Ultraman Tiga was was like I believe was the first because I don't think it ever did it in the show era. No. And Tiga was the start of the Heisei era. Uh. I mean, unless you want to count like stuff like you know, because because before that, you, unless you want to count stuff like Ultraman Powered or Ultraman Great, <laughs> which uh, Tiga, what? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> yeah, Ultraman Tiga was the first main series in the Heisei era, and it started the the whole four change series. So, and that was back in '96. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to Super Sentai, I think it was. Co- I think it was quite a while before they before they um before they started teasing the before they started toying around with the idea of upgrade forms. Yeah, I think well, yeah, cuz I think the first one to drill like I'm trying to think back for and like not counting stuff like Zero Ranger where it had, you know, passing on the shield. I think the first series to dabble with that might have been Mega Ranger, but even then that was a one-off movie, not a full series. Because of the fact that it's a one-off movie, I can't count Mega Ranger. No. No. No, they didn't dabble with form changes for God forever. Mm-hmm. I'd say you'd have to go all the way to Shinkinger for that. I'd s- there, ha- there had been team up... there. As far as as far as far as up as far as upgrade forms, um, I keep thinking of I keep thinking of of whether or not uh, of whether or not Abba Ranger was one of, was an early, was one of the earliest oh, adopters. Oh yeah, yeah, I forgot about Abba Ranger. Yeah, the rampage forms. Mm-hmm. Abba, yeah, yeah, the Abba forms. Yeah, that 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 would be the first. Mm-hmm. So it what so it. I guess I had I guess I had the years mixed up mixed up in regard yeah. in regards to what in regards to what came first but the f- but the fact that it's the fact that it took them that long and it and um the whole idea of the whole idea of even doing some of doing something armor related with Ultraman didn't happen until way into the Heisei era I mean, as much as a lot of, I'd say a lot of the form, a lot of the form changes have just been have the main, the main dip, the main difference has always been, um, has always been color layout more than it, more than anything else. Yeah. And there, I'd say this, I'd say this probably, I'd say the benefit to that is. It's gonna be it, it's gonna be somewhat easier on the suit actor. 
you know, because you don't you don't have to worry about it as much extra weight, and you're already get you're already get. Well, for the for whoever's the suit actor for Ultraman, which for the kaiju, um. Well, there's a reason why early why early suit actors for Godzilla were were um former sumo or baseball players. Yeah, the the, the suit the kaiju suits for Ultraman and Godzilla were uh, to call them bulky would be an understatement because good fucking Christ. <laughs> I mean, oh, let's be fair. All any kaiju suit from any Toku series is going to be a little bulky because they have to look pretty monstrous, but. There was a special kind of bulkiness when it comes to Ultraman. Mm-hmm. And with bu- with bulkiness comes weight, and you're not doing this shit in one take. With bulkiness comes weight and heat. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, this is Godzilla related. It's a it's a good case in point of how much of a nightmare uh, being a suit actor can be, and why they would. Why? Why endurance was the thing they were looking for when they were picking suit actors. The the suit the Godzilla suit for the Return of Godzilla in '84 was only u- that version of that suit was only used for that movie and no other movie. Largely because it was a complete and total nightmare to work with, as Chuck had pointed out in his re- his review of '85. They drew. They were drilling holes in the fingertips so he wouldn't drown in his own sweat. Which is, you know, worrying. Because mm-hmm. it, it's not like it's not like those suits are going to be all that well ventilated for the for those shots. Kind of hard to ventilate that shit. Mm-hmm. At least not without it being noticeable on screen back then. Yeah, I don't know. I'd imagine it's probably somewhat easier, but I wouldn't call it easy nowadays. They've likely got a lot more uh, breathable materials and also lighter materials with things like, you know, carbon nanotubing. Yeah, you can make a very effective looking kaiju suit much lighter by using things like that, though. I don't know if they'd spring for it. (laughs) Um. Like I said, easier, not necessarily easy. Mm. Uh, but I mean, just the the change the change in in materials over the years has allowed for is what has allowed for uh, bulkier bulkier forms for both you know heroes and kaiju and and other monsters in all of Toku to become more uh, extravagant. I guess is the best word. You know, detailed. We'll go with detailed. That too, but like there, there's a certain amount of creating these very uh, elaborate costumes in some cases. So mm-hmm. even then, um, the the bulkiness of the kaiju in Ultraman, along with the Ultraman being pretty slim because they're for the most part, guys in Zentai suits with some additionals um, was a really good contrast, in fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you'd you'd have that contrast of the human versus the monstrous, because even though, you know, the Ultramen are giants of light from the, from the you know, the, the planet of brightness in, in that nebula, they are protecting humanity. And it is specifically them protecting humanity mm-hmm. um, from whatever threat it might be. So it's, it's it, if you boil it down when it comes to the actual conflict between Ultraman and Kaiju, it's a very classic man versus the unknown. Mm-hmm. And we, obviously, there, obviously, there's been there's been different ta- there's been different takes. I because of the cons- because of the consistency within the within setting, I cannot but wonder if Su- if somebody at Subaraya paid paid heed to something that I've something that I've been ranting about when it comes to writing for years, and that being the importance of a series bible. I wouldn't doubt it. Um, yeah, th- th- this. 
that this franchise clearly has a series Bible going on because it, it keeps everything in line. Hell, even like the big crossover movies that don't interfere with any main series. They're just kind of their own little thing. But it's there's still at least some level of consistency and in connection with their main series. Like you, you see past ultras from like the bit, even more recent series. There's, they're tying things back to the events of the main series that they came from. Mm-hmm. And which, Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say, which all things considered, that's honestly impressive. Even if the movies don't end up being very good. Cause let's be honest, some of them can be outright shit, but at least that level of con- that little uh, that level of consistency really does make it feel like some like it like there's this giant universe of ultras that you want to keep an eye on. Mm-hmm. And th- and of course and of course in the process we've ha- we've we've seen the intro- we've seen the introduction of certain certain lar- certain large fo- certain large folks who are not ne- who are in that in that same high level but they're not they are not kaiju but they're not but they're not um ultras um you know things things like things like for instance mirror knight yeah and obviously he's just he's just one ex- he's just one example of dozens but it, as time has gone on you, we have seen more of these su- these support these supporting characters of of that particular scale, as well as the as well as the possibility of full on mech use. John Nine, anybody? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I'd say I'd say John. I say he's the biggest example of it. And vehicles have always been used, but they've been used in a way that's analogous to the vehicles in. Can't believe I'm gonna make this reference. Thunderbirds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the amount of times we probably made—I'm pretty sure we made tons of Thunderbirds references when we were watching Ultra when we were watching Ultra Seven. But also, if I'm gonna bring up Jean Nine, we have to remind ourselves of the glory that is the Jean Nine Dick Laser. <laughs> why would you? Why? Why? Why would you bring that up right now? Why? Simply, simple, Zan. Because when that first appeared, when we riffed Ginga, the jokes never stopped. Our chat, when we saw that episode, when he used that laser, the rest of the show was nothing but dick jokes. And Dicks all I, the way down. I guess you could call it Dick World instead of Disc World. <laughs> yeah, could for the sake of it, could you give me a re- could you put a refresher for me in Council? Give me a minute. I'll have to find it. Mm-hmm. I had to find a picture of John. Knight. While while you do that, I sh- I should bring up that the original Ultraman had a, had a um very well played fake out because if you look at the original o- if you look at the original opening for the early episodes, it starts out looking like the opening to Ultra Q until the screen shatters. Well, I mean they gotta they gotta trick you into thinking it's more Ultra Q somehow, right? <laughs> Some things, some things don't change, even though, even though there, even though there are certain, um, there are certain opening fakeouts that, that ended up pissing me off. Looking at you, Geo, <laughs> teasing me with next level and then dro- and then not doing it. I appreciate, I All appreciate right. the bait and switch, but also fuck you. All right, I can't find a vi- an image of him actually using the laser. But uh, here's an image of what he looks like. Which, pretty sta- pretty sta- pretty standard fare. Although the coloring makes me th- ma- is making me think of a certain Bomberman that I don't want to talk about. Oh wait 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 wait! Scratch that! I found it. Boom. <sighs> <sighs> no, <laughs> let's hold on. You for, you forgot to tell everybody that not only is this a dick dick laser, he's t posing for dominance. I, I forgot he did the fucking t pose. I forgot about the fucking t pose. 
We didn't, that wasn't even a thing back then. <laughs> I mean, maybe not among the rest of you casuals who don't play Gary's mod. All right, fair, fair, but still. <laughs> That's the reason. <laughs> Dear Tokuger, I am so sorry for giving nope, you shit nope, about... Nope, nope, that's still... That's still worse. That is nope. still fucking worse. What's worse? Come on, let him say it. The dick train. <laughs> no, no, this is worse, because not only is it a dick laser, he's T-posing. The dick train is not worse. <laughs> You have to take everything in context. Um, as an as an aside, I would pay good money to be a fly on the wall where, where there's some meeting at Hasbro where they're deciding what um se what season to adapt next, and then somebody brings up Tokuger. <laughs> yeah, I'm I, I'm reasonably sure it's been it, it's been asked. Like I remember uh, Chip Lynn being asked about adapting Tokuger, and. He didn't outright say it, but you could just tell by his tone that there was no way they were touching Tokuger. Mm -hmm. Probably Doesn't wouldn't have surprise. worked all that well either because there's not as much of a train culture. But also because of that. I mean... I'm not, I'm not one to say that dick jokes aren't funny because they absolutely fucking are. <laughs> So, yeah, but if you're doing it for a, if you're doing dick jokes for a young audience, you have to be a little you have to be a little more um, subtle about it. Yeah, and there ain't nothing fucking subtle about this. <laughs> like, when, and when I say subtle, I mean I mean things like fingerprints in Animaniacs. Yeah. No thanks. You know. The kind of jokes that when you're a kid would fly right over your head, but when you're looking back at, uh, as an adult, you're like, how the fuck did they get away with that? Exactly. No, there, there's no subtlety with Jean Nye. Like, you see that, that's the first thing you're thinking of. Mm -hmm. If they put it on the chest, I would have been fine with it, because then I could just say it's a Mazinger reference. Although yeah, you probably no. couldn't call it breast fire. Well, I don't know. Common Rider Rose got away with a breast cannon. Fair. <laughs> but I mean, they call they call uh, any of the Aphrodite series robots uh, missiles. Um, e e the name of the robot missiles, but they're her, they're her boobs. She's shooting her boobs at you. Oh yeah. <laughs> but still, yeah. You take one look at this. There is no question what you're seeing right there. <laughs> and but e but even with even with that there's but there ha at some I'm not sure when this happened but it's at some point there were there were attempts to ha to have different origin stories for different ultras and and in so in some case in some cases some of them being a little bit more roguish than others. Um I think again. I think, I, th I think this again. This started back in Tiga, where he wasn't like a mem. He wasn't uh, part of the Land of Light. He was just like this ancient guardian. Mm -hmm. the, the, they during the Heisei era, they tried to do this whole eight, uh, alternate timeline shit that eventually got retconned to hell and back. But that was kind of the thing they were doing for a while. Was that a lot of those ultras were not. Uh, guardians from the land of light. They were just like these other worldly beings or ancient guardians or whatever. If, if I recall, they were trying to go with Tiga onward. They were trying to go with a ancient civilization motif. Yeah. Which the problem is the given that the given that there are people from the land of light that are millions of years old. It's kind of hard for that to stick. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> they are an ancient civilization. I, I was the about to say. Off. Yeah, I was. I was. I was about to say. Uh, where's Where's the excuse when you know there are there are definitely giants of light who have lived for the time of multiple ancient civilizations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it was something that the, it's the reason why they've retconned it in recent years because they kind of realized, yeah, that didn't work out because 
I mean, the, 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 the giants of light were an ancient civilization. They were just ones that didn't die off by some horrible reason. You know, they, their technology is so advanced it comes off as magical. And while there's always been a bit of a Clark's Law effect, by doing by trying to go with the whole ancient civilization thing, a lot of I'd say a lot of people associate that with more magical forms of storytelling. And they they can that's that's somewhat true. Yeah. And even with even with even with the ridiculousness of Ultraman, like I like I said before, it's for the most part stuck to science fiction in a pulpy way but science fiction nonetheless so introducing something that could be seen as as ma as magic or even clark even leaning further into the whole clark's law thing probably wasn't going to stick after after four, after um thir after 30 years of mo of mostly doing um SF it's like good idea maybe the maybe the wrong maybe the wrong timing or to put it another way good effort have some steak <laughs> exactly <laughs> and that being that being said one thing, one thing that can that can arguably make things a bit of a a bit of a hard sell when bringing people into the Ultra series is the is the lack of a the lack of a consistent villain. I'd say well, throughout for the most part, yeah, there are there are cert there are certain villains that were that were very that were that were very ultra specific th things like Faust. Actually, I think if you want to name an, a, a very ultra specific villain that has become, I wouldn't say reoccurring, but very has come up more than a few times, Belial. I was I was holding off on touching on touching Belial. I'm I'm more referring to before that. I can't think I can't think of a I can't think of a recur of a recurring a recurring villain. You just have a large um, rogues gallery of of kaiju. And on paper, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that, but it is. It is something that it is something that's tr that's tricky to work with because every good hero needs a villain, and with so with something like Common Rider, you had the you had that for the longest time during the Showa era with the many, 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 many incarnations of Shocker. To the point where, and even afterwards, you start, even into the Hayes era, you did start to see the concept of villainous organizations in some form or another. Yeah. Not not in the same not in the same not in the same setup as Shocker once once was, but it was still present. There's always a central force guiding the vill like a central villainous force guiding things. Mm hmm throughout each season even if it was completely independent of anybody anyone any other group yeah even in some even in something like Ryuki which we've talked about you have you have somebody you have some antagonist that's that's the driving force in the as much in the man in the mirror <laughs> literally <laughs> mm -hmm. and in you had you had something a bit more organized in Kuga because there's the Gageru and the rules of it. Yeah. And you of you of course had you of course had the you of course had the um the lord the to the Lord of the, I believe it was the Lord of Light in um Agito. And in Fives, you had in Fives, you had Smart Brain, and and you get the point. Yeah, you go all day if we try to mm -hmm. go through all that. <laughs> but the lack of that does the lack of that does create a bit a bit of an issue. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have villains that do pop up in each Ultraman. You've got stuff like the Zeton, the Edos, Yapool, and stuff like that. But there was no central force. It was just 
Oh, here's this random alien that just showed up. We got to mm. deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot. I'd say a. I'd say a lot of that shit. I'd say a lot of that changed with, um, Belial, and there was al- there was already a bit of a shifting to that because, I'd say I'd say, in my opinion, one of the big turn one of the big turning points when it came to tone, with uh, with Ultraman in the Hase era, was Ultra Seven X. Yeah, Ultra 7X was an attempt to create a darker, more mature series where instead of it focusing strictly on the monsters, you had this big... You had a secret organization. You had big mysteries left and right. You are a hero who doesn't remember who he is for that for the most part. Like, it was a very different form of Ultraman from anything we had seen before or since. Mm-hmm. And that's also where we started to get hint, get hints of of some type of some type of vil, of some type of villainous entity that's na- that's named after character that named after characters in mythology of all things, um, and at, and when that happened, you start you started to see. St- I think Des Shinta had put it best when he, when he said that storytelling started to lean a bit more into, um, j- into J dr- into almost J drama styles of storytelling rather than what had been done before. And. And yeah, I did. I did double check. That was. That was intended to be for an, for a older audience, um, which you could see. I mean, it, it was, and it didn't do half bad. It wasn't a terrible series by any stretch. It's just, no, if you're so you when when you become so ingrained as to what Ultraman is, something like Ultra Seven X can really stick out like a sore thumb. Mm-hmm. And I do, I don't think I don't want to make any any claim that Ultra Seven X is bad. I think it. I think it. Ha- I think it had a bit of an issue with for, with first impressions because of how different it was being. But I would hardly call it bad. No. And it's it's impressive that they managed to get so much out of it when it was only a twelve episode run. But. Speaking of speaking of that kind of thing, this is a this is as good of a point to, to, for us to talk about one particular issue with the Ultra series that's been a pet peeve of mine for a while, because I think I think this is something that's overstated its welcome by several years. It's time to talk about powers of the past. Ah uh, yes, this officially really kicked into high gear. Like. There had been one series prior to this trend that did a whole connection to the past, which was Ultraman Mabius, but it was an anniversary series, and it was more about learning from past Ultras, to, but still having the central hero being its own thing. It The powers of the past really started becoming a thing, starting with Ultraman Ginga. And again, it made sense then because it was an anniversary series. It was honoring the history of Ultraman, with its own story and the hero could transform into not only past ultras, but past Kaiju. It could transform into select Kaiju temporarily if it wanted, if they wanted to, but then it had ultras. Then you had Ginga S and ultra and, uh, that whole storyline where it introduced the idea of combining powers of the past, where Ginga could call upon, abilities of past ultras by hitting hitting a button on a wheel mm-hmm. which got a little silly and unfortunately it started a massive trend that we're still while has been dialed back a tad still kind of persists to this day i mean even the next series is going to have something along the lines yeah and the big problem that I've had with the pow- with the powers of the past thing is that unless it's done in a proper context, for for one, 
I think a lot of the times that it's been done, the reason for, the reason for it was always a stretch. And I know this was around a time when there were some behind the scenes issues with Subaraya, which we'll get which we'll get to. But things like things like but there are certain things that we're going to be a we're going to be a hard um buy for buy for me. The big one is of course um the Spark dolls. Yeah. No matter how, no matter how many how many times I try, I try and um, I try and talk myself into it. The spark, the spark dolls just just look ridiculous in transformations. It they really did. Like I get again, it was it was an anniversary series, so it made some sense. But it's I call it the the common rider drive effect, where it was so painfully obvious they were meant as a toy promotion. Yeah, that it broke the immersion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this. The Spark Dolls were absolutely just them selling toys. You know, later series would kind of get around this a little bit, even though it was still kind of bad. Ultraman X and Ultraman Orb using cards was kind of silly. I don't think it really got, had a chance to really... I think Ultraman G was where they finally seemed to have gotten a good grip on things. And at the very least, G with with Jeed's use of the whole DN... With the whole... Helix based thing. I was willing to buy that because that ma that made somewhat sense given um given these given Geed's bit um origin. Yeah, he was a child of Belial. Again, going back to them being a major villain of the whole thing. He was a child of Belial mm -hmm. who was meant to be basically Belial's vessel. So and and basically combining his power with that of the Ultras to create the ultimate destroyer made absolute sense for him to tap into those powers. And it worked very well, but that was really the only series that actually, at least as far as the Heisei era where they got it right. Mm -hmm. Ultraman orb didn't make any sense because they had this whole thing of him being this, uh, this ancient hero, this, you know, but all of a sudden he can just tap combine cards from different ultras. Like why, what is, what sense did it make? Ultraman RB uh, didn't make any sense having all those powers. It just had ties to past stuff, including Orb, ironically, because they had Orb Dark, which yeah, not even more confusing. RB it made even it made even less sense for me because it seemed like it, it seemed like the theme with RB was supposed to be um, family. Yeah, especially once the sister got involved. Mm-hmm. And. Taiga downplayed it a little bit, not by much, but a little bit. They didn't really focus on past ultras as heavily, and Ultraman Z honestly has not has not been too bad. Like I'm like right now over on Tokaris, we're halfway into Ultraman Z. It's been pretty good. Z, you know, I I would say is a case where I can where I can justify the gimmick. Yeah, because he's a prodigy of zero, and the metals are basically explained as to why they exist. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the thing. This is something I've said about many of these kind of gimmicks in general, is we understand as fans that no matter what, these are toy promotions. You are making these gimmicks because you want to sell the toys. Mm -hmm. But if you can integrate them into the story properly... We are willing to look past that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's why the Gaia memories in Common Render Double work so well. Because, yeah, they're toys, but you've created a storyline as to why they work. Mm -hmm. Here, but use the you... here use the USBs of Mother Earth herself to create powers. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But when you can't do that, and you just have them for the sake of having them, you break the immersion. We realize. We, you, we, we then say, oh, wait, this is just their toy promotion here. Again, Common Rider Drive is the prime example of this, and it's sad that I have to use two Riku Sanjo Bay series to make both points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, yeah, the shift cars, there was no way they could justify those properly without coming off as a cheap toy gimmick. 
Yeah, but even even with the whole even with the whole heavy acceleration of effect, it's it's hard it's hard to go from that to vehicles. Um, yeah. And I'm yeah. not saying I'm not saying that you can't do that because well, five D five D's did five D's did that with the whole moment with the whole momentum form of energy. Exactly, but you know, with this, it just did not work. And Ultraman had that same problem. Mm -hmm. You know, they they started with Ginga, and even though it made sense for them to tap into the powers of the past, the toys just looked like fucking toys. Even in the show, yeah, like, they they having, look like dolls. They look like fucking dolls, especially Portaro, who d literally was just a talking doll that was just guiding them along, and it just looked so fucking stupid the entire time they did it, which is why they did not bring it back for Ginga S, even though they still I'm, kept the Spark Dolls thing. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not so, like, yeah, I know that they're called Spark Dolls, among other things. But they legitimately look like an action figure of collector places on their on their shelf. Yeah, they totally did, which made it, it just did not work. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's why they dropped that in favor of cards and medals and capsules and everything else and later gimmicks, which you know get take take your pick on which ones worked, which one didn't. But at least they tried. Yeah, I mean, it, it, all toy gimmicks are going to be a little bit invasive. They are. Um, it's, it's just the nature of the beast. But if you can work it in right, it becomes a lot less of a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very true. After all, if we're if we're going to use one more common writer example for comparison, uh, drive is what happens when when you do it wrong. Uh, build is what happens when you do it right. It's yeah. very obvious that the full bottles are meant to be the 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 toy, but God damn, do they make sense in the universe? Yeah, mm -hmm. they are they are the collective energies that they used of the of the nebula gas in a form that tapped into uh, uh, biological and mechanical components to combine into something new. Like yep. they they made it fit within the narrative. Well, yep. the other the other thing that with with each of the one with each of the good examples that you brought up, that's tapping into a theme that common writer has had since day one and that it that is the um both both sides both sides of the coin the heroes and the villains drawing upon either the same theme or the same power source for throughout exactly. most of the sh throughout most of the showa era it was sh shocker or their in or their incarnation was making cyborgs and one of those happened to be the hero yep they um, literally yeah. got their powers from the villain Mm -hmm. Which I'd um, say is an I'd say is an artifact of of um sh of Ishinomori's earlier work, Cyborg Zero Zero Nine. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, absolutely. the reason I br the reason that we're bringing one might say, why are you bringing up Common Rider in a discussion about Ultraman? One, I love contrast when making a point. Two, you have two so you have two solo heroes, and thus you can. For the most part, and you can use that as a point of comparison. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking speaking of things that that um, I, sh I do before I go on, I do want to make it. From what I recall, wasn't it that Zet was was more of a Z was more of a Zeto fanboy that just annoyed Z annoyed zero annoyed zero into into be into um giving him some kind of assistance and the whole thing with him going to earth was you can come back when you you can come back when you've learned a thing or two <laughs> no 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 that was not the origin for zet uh come on uh, ultraman zet mm -hmm. he was joining zero on a mission and because of some kind of event zero had to go deal with this massive energy cluster or whatever i don't forget i don't forget exactly what it was mm -hmm. but he uh, Zet got sent to Earth to basically uh, investigate what was going on down there and collect the metals that were. Uh, no, it was defeat this one monster, and when they defeated it, it spread the metals all over the place. So then they had to go collect those. Because mm -hmm. there, there always seemed to be a very coming of age theme with um, Zet. 
Very much. Uh, and, and it kind of fit in a lot of other, a lot of more recent ultras, especially in the Reiwa era, kind of fit that theme as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and late, and late uh, Heisei era did the same thing. Again, Jeed and RB kind of fit that narrative of, yeah, coming of age. I'd say, G I'd say Jeed was the earliest ca case of it simply because of who and what, who and what Jeed is along with, <laughs> along with the fact that I think as I think as time has gone on, we've seen. I think we've seen less of the, um, less of the possession type type of instance, and more of the ultra more of the ultra of that season being, akin to a symbiote. Yeah, I definitely would say there's a symbiotic relationship going on, because uh, you you like, compare it to something like Ultra Seven, where it was it wasn't even possession; it was. Se Ultra Seven taking a human form mm -hmm. in the form of Dan Moraboshi. Here with with stuff like Jeed, it is very much. Actually, no, Jeed was also more of a human form. It's just one that didn't realize he was a human form. Mm -hmm. It, uh, but yeah, stuff like Zet definitely a symbiotic relationship. It was like, you know, I need I need a human body to to hand, to live on Earth and investigate things. You. I'll help you help me live on Earth. I help you deal with all this crazy shit you're, that we uh, that we've accidentally brought down here. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking speaking of things that that may have ex that may have extended beyond, and I know I said I was holding off on Belial. Now it's time for me to rip off that band aid because it's impossible for me to talk about Belial alone without talking about Zero. <laughs> now. <laughs> I had jokingly referred to Z to Zero at one point as the Deno of Ultraman, and I I was being a little bit harsh and a little bit facetious because he's not nearly that bad. In fact, Zero has been very has been very popular, and he's a very good character. Plus, there was the fact that he was he kind of ended up being the flag bearer during that during that time when there were no Ultra series. There was there were just movies. So many movies. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, the the problem, the, the reason why we compare him to Deno is that he just kind of tends to stick his head into everything these days. Like you know, we go back to Jeed. He show he becomes a big player in Jeed, and uh, I dare anyone to defend Zero Beyond to me. I will do no such thing. That form is ugly as shit. And it did not need to exist. Mm -hmm. I I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> also, you know, when you're also when you're like being ref when you're being referred to as the strongest ultra, that's going to ruffle a few feathers. Yeah, like I, they, they even in the crossover uh, movies, they tend to hold Zero up on a pedestal as like this great ultra that has like surpassed all others. Like fuck you. I mean. Early, I mean, yeah. In the early on, he there was the whole thing of him being a hot, of him being a hothead who had who had to learn humility, and I was perfectly fine with that. But trying to trying to treat him as if he's some as if he's some sort of elder statesman doesn't qu doesn't quite work when there's still when there's still a degree of that hot headedness, especially with him using the old "you're ten years too early" cliche. You have no uh, room to talk, sir. <laughs> You're ten years too early, cliche. Ah, uh, one of my favorite general themes of Wusha. Mm -hmm. And well, don't get me wrong. I like I like the thing as well, but it's but you can't really t you can't really talk on that fr on that front. Given the given the subject matter, and that of course brings us to Belial, who. I'd say it, I'd say Belial was the uh, was the out and out first true villain, recurring villain in the in the Ultra series. It's like it, like we said earlier, we can't really think we can't really think of an instance before that that really qualifies. Well, and yeah. that's usually because whatever threat that came was something from a different source each time. Mm hmm but it's very it's very clear that they it's very clear that they wanted a 
with Zero and Belial to a kind of um, a kind of a kind of superhero and supervillain approach. And yeah, all the ultras can fit into the can fit into the superhero mold in some more in some form or fashion. But mm -hmm. this is especially the case with Zero and Belial. Superman and Lex Luthor, Batman and the Joker, take take your pick. <laughs> oh, that fi that very much felt like what they were trying to go with, especially when you look at the des the design of Belial. Oh, then again, if you're going to be named after one of the demons in the Goetia, I suppose you got to deliver. Ars Gotia. Mm -hmm. And the thing and gr granted through, throughout the films there def there definitely was there definitely was that feel especially especially given the whole thing where the two where the two of them really despised each other more so Bel more so Belial for putting us for zero scarring him and the culmination of that was the whole crisis impact incident which maybe it's because of the name but i felt like crisis impact was there it was their attempt to do something akin to a event comic from a, from a from a superhero comic book i, I think it, i think it's the name yeah Crisis Impact. I mean, where have we heard things similar to that before? <laughs> Infinite Crisis. Actually, I wouldn't be surprised if that was. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that was the influence because that was because Crisis Impact definitely felt like it was supposed to be a soft reset of the Ultra series, and Crisis on Infinite Earths in DC was an, was an attempt to clean house. It wasn't completely successful, but it was an attempt. It was an attempt, and it was the best attempt, and should have probably been the only attempt. At least that version of it. Mm -hmm. How many how many crises have we had now? How many infinites have we had? Um, That's a different story for a different day. I'm a, if I if I were to list that out, I'd have to I'd have to treat Infinite Crisis as a exception, largely because that was meant as a direct sequel. I understand that. Regardless, uh, like I said, that's a different discussion for a different day. Oh yeah. And when it comes, but for but um, you would think you would think that after after that after you have Belial try and break the fucking universe and fa yeah. and fail at it due to the sacrifice of the father of Ultra. That that would be it. That would be it. That would be that. That would be it. When it can, that would be the send off for Belial. But they kept bringing him back. Yep. They brought him. They brought him back several times over. Um. I think it. I think it. I think at one point we. I think at one point. Even Belial was like, "Why the fuck am I back?" <laughs> it wasn't in Zet where that happened, but it was. But it it was a few series before that. And turning him, and of course the the ridiculousness of turning him into a into a power up weapon. Looking at you, Orb. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you when you said. There was a point where he even said that, why the fuck am I back? The only thing that stuck in my head was, it was not by my choice that I returned. It was humans who wished to pay me tribute. <laughs> and, you know, from a meta perspective, that's true. It's a bunch of fans that wanted him to come back. And the this is this is this is a bit of an issue that ends up ha that 
ends up ha that ends up happening when when you have when you have a character who do who does a little too well for their own good. That's why yep. er that's why earlier on we we um we brought up the overachieving of of characters like Dan Kuroto and and the like. Yeah, prior to the start of the of the episode. Yeah, prior to the show we were talking about Dan Kuroto and how he became such an iconic villain in X Aid that they kept trying to recreate him through other villains and it never really worked. So they just brought back Dan instead. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the I think the real issue though is there's a way they could have done bringing back Belial well uh, because as we've remarked throughout this whole thing the the hallmark of Ultraman is consistency uh, because everything does tend to be connected it's all the same you know planet of the bright all the same giants of light all the same nebula uh and all the all those different elements uh belial could be a recurring element maybe as an inspiration for an organization that springs up around his sacrifice mm -hmm. as they as they would see it um and, you know, maybe Tsuburaya will take that up. Maybe Tsuburaya, someone over there, will think of that and be like, you know, he's a fan favorite, but he doesn't need to keep coming back. Instead, his ideals can be passed on to new villains. And so long as they don't try to make carbon copy villains like, you know, Toei has done with Dan Kuroto and Kamen Rider, um, it could be a very, very successful way of creating a sort of recurring but not really villain. Mm -hmm. more of a recurring clash of ideals mm -hmm. so uh Tsuburaya, if if you need if you need someone to scenario write that for you um just give me a good salary mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't even have to hire a translator for a good chunk of it <laughs> I'd only have to give outlines because mm -hmm. it's like you just have to follow these general steps. Now take it to your scenario writers and have them write the specifics. Yeah, and the thing, especially si especially since the the kind of vil the I'd say I'd say I'd say the um the only t the only time that I was will I was willing to have him re have him reappear in a in a, in a means that actually made somewhat of sense were his clashes with Geed for obvious reasons he's because Geed is technically Belial's son <laughs> in a in a very um in a very synthetic manner but still but still yeah but they made that a central point of the narrative is that G while Jeed was his son, he became his own thing. He became his own person, his own hero, mm -hmm. and fought against his own quote unquote father to be what he wanted to be. And oh god, I just realized I just realized what um what analogy we I can use when it comes to these two. And Zan, you're not gonna like this. Oh god. Oh, no. Geed is Solid Snake, the son of Big Boss. Uh. <laughs> no, there's there's a reason I don't like this, and it has nothing to do with that, that comparison. It has everything to do with conversations about Metal Gear over in the Across uh, Discord. <laughs> but that's a that's a story for after we're done here. Oh, it um, could have been worse. I could have brought up Eli. <laughs> that's. That's just that's just liquid. That's just liquid. Exactly. Little boy liquid, but still liquid. Just liquid on his daddy's pants. <laughs> Remember, he got all the recessive genes. Although to to be fair, I do I do love that hit that his voice actor in Solid has embr has embraced the meme and has has um 
Has or has done gags like order fa like order fast food in his liquid snake voice. Oh, Doesn't God. surprise me. <laughs> Does not surprise me, David. I'm sure David Hayter has done the same thing. I am absolutely 110 percent sure that. Dude, uh, I wouldn't question it. I would not fucking question it. D D David Hayter, do you have a Metal Gear? <laughs> if not, I'll take a chocolate shake. Your shake machine is broken. It must be a Metal Gear. <laughs> this is a guy who, when, when someone asked about Igor Raptor's Metal Gear Awesome series, he immediately was on that shit. Mm -hmm. like, uh, like, oh, without any prompting, without any explanation, he just went, oh, hotness, I want to bang you. <laughs> he was on that shit. Mm -hmm. Back when Ego Raptor was good. Yeah, Peck before he had a girlfriend. Yeah. Now, <laughs> with the, with that in mind, when it come when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to do when it comes to doing a that sort that sort of inheritor of of Belial's of Belial's mentality. As tempting as it would be, I if someone were to do that down the road, I would advise against the idea of a evil ultra. Large, largely because of the fact that the whole the whole evil version of the, of the of the main character is something that's is something that has a very limited shelf life in terms of how in terms of how you can use it. Uh, like yeah, let's consider let's consider other let's consider other works that have done it. Um, Dragon Ball has only has only done the, has really only done it once. I know some people might bring up Turles. That doesn't count. <laughs> and to be and to be fair, the Goku Black arc was even with all even with all of its faults was probably one of was probably the best arc of Super. In terms of story, yes. In terms of Sakuga, that's still the tournament of power. In terms of Sakuga, obviously, absolutely not. In terms of in terms of story, yes, and in terms of memes. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> you're only saying that because you're black. Fuck you! <laughs> God damn it, Zan! Hey, hey! He left it hanging in the open. I was obligated. <laughs> Obligated, I tell you. <laughs> and, 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 and you know what? I'm gonna throw that back because, really, throughout most of the arc, he wasn't. He wasn't even. He didn't. He, he was freaking Super Saiyan Rose or whatever the fuck they called it. Yeah, that yeah it was Rose. And the the point the point is is that you ha is you d you um you had it you had it feel like an actual threat. Um. Also, it, also it's a little harder to do. It's a little harder. To, to do the whole evil hero thing without feeling cliche because of how many times we've put up with Superman but evil in the last five years alone. Yeah, no shit. You you could maybe get away with, with Omni -Man? someone doing that as an evil ultra once, but only once. Mm -hmm. After that, you quickly lose the luster. I, I think the issue with having an evil ultra d isn't even like, whether it's a cliche or not. Uh, I don't I, I legitimately think it, it can't work in the lore. I don't think the Giants of Light are capable of being evil. <laughs> yeah, the only, the only reason Belial ended up the way he did was because he fused with another entity. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. what you could do, what you could do, if you really wanted to have this kind of thing, is maybe have someone that looks like an Ultra, but not actually be an Ultra. Maybe they decided to take the form of an ultra to give the ultras a bad name. Yes. Either that. I mean, that's actually let me let me raise you one on that. Somebody who took who took the form of an ultra out of obsession. And if it if it sounds like I'm if it sounds like I'm syndrome. dipping into, I was it's I was, syndrome. Actually, I wasn't going with syndrome. I was going with reverse flash. I I don't care. It's still syndrome. <laughs> Obsessive uh, fan. <laughs> 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 uh, 
I'm not to not to say a fan, but somebody but somebody who was obsessed with reaching that with reaching the level of power that the ultras have. I I understand. I just, I still think Syndrome's the better comparison. <laughs> Although you know what, we'll say you're both right and move on. Yeah. <laughs> the point the point is is that is that in doing that you can. You can ha you can have the con you can have the concept of the fallen hero, but not but not in uh, not in as obvious of a manner. That's when everyone's ultra, no one is. Oh my god! God damn it! That. <laughs> 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 You know what makes it worse, Mark? <sighs> I could see a storyline to that effect actually being a thing. It would it would fit Ultraman pretty well, actually. Yeah, and as far as far as what as far as whether the ultras are a are able to well, for starters, the people in the Land of Light have to have to be ex have to be accepted into getting that ability even to getting that ability and being able to venture out as an ultra to begin with. Which it, which provi which provides an which provides an effective catch on the matter, and the soul yeah. the the main reason Belial got exiled was because he was fucking around with a plasma spark. Yeah, yeah, but the but the point is if 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 it's someone who had an obsession of uh with the ultras taking a form that looked like them but achieving their level of power in a different fashion, he actually could in the end make everyone an ultra in effect if not in fact mm -hmm. yeah and, and we and the you know that this is where we have to bring in the crossover movies because th there's a lot of the lore is hidden within those movies you know you watch the main series they they focus a lot on the main character so obviously mm -hmm. they don't have time to explore the world building but if you watch the crossover movies whoop boy do they cover a lot of ground there that's where the because of the fact that they don't have to be limited to being on Earth in those films, that's where they have room to really expand on that. Yeah, we actually get to see a lot more of the Land of Light in in those crossovers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, granted, you got to be prepared for some serious cheese uh, with stuff like we watched. Uh, we actually watched the Absolute Conspiracy a little while back. Also, word of advice: if you're going to watch these movies. And you want to take them any semblance of seriously? Do not watch the dubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ultraman dubs are uh, are an experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. They really are. Like we, we had to watch. We watched the dub version for Tokerus because, I mean, come on, that level of cheese is perfect for us. Oh yeah. I mean, there's a reason you're called Toku Riffs. Exactly. <laughs> but, <laughs> If you do this, you cannot take these movies seriously, even if they are really well done, which, storyline-wise, Absolute Conspiracy wasn't half bad. Like, take away the cheesiness of the dub, it was an actually a decent story. Like, a retelling of Belial's story and also th uh, throwing in Ultraman Traegar and Absolute Tartarus, this this big, you know, the, uh, the Absolute Conspiracy that was going on, that they were creating, was really interesting, and I'm... Looking forward to seeing the follow-up movie for that. Mm -hmm. But again, if you don't, if you watch the dub, you cannot take it seriously because it is so fucking bad. Like we legitimately looked into this. A lot of the voice actors for the dub were the same people who did dub the dubs for stuff like Mega Man X Four. What am I fighting for? Yeah. yeah. And so. You can just imagine the the quality of voice acting we've got going on here. Mm -hmm. Almost Taro, as, as for fuck's sake, that <laughs> voice actor for Taro. Is it all, is it almost as good as uh as the Doctor Light in Mega Man Eight? It never reaches that level what? of oh good god, but <laughs> <laughs> what Me Mega Man? We must we must go get the evil energy to defeat Doctor Wowie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't, we don't get that level of bad, but it, de it definitely, again, that's why I say Mega Man X4. It's on, it's on a similar level to that. Like, just if you watch an episode, uh, any episode of Zeto where they have the freaking uh, Absolute Conspiracy ads playing, and just 
listen because they use the dub for the ads and Oof. oh god i just i i the one thing i can't get in the mega man 8 uh dub as an aside here is how they allowed the voice actors take for dr light where he almost says wily instead of mega man to actually get into the game i'd like i liken that to the fact that in those days there was not there was not a, there was a very hands-off attitude regarding direction a very wild west attitude even mhm mm but th that's just my my aside for this whole thing yeah if a uh, i'm i'm someone who has taken to watching subs pretty much exclusively these days people just cuz that's my preference but in in this case uh Yes, definitely the subs for these movies. If you want to not be laughing your ass off the entire time and actually pay some attention. Yeah. And earlier I admit earlier I'd mentioned that there were some behind the scenes problems. So I think this is <clears throat> this is as good a time to talk to talk to talk about the legal troubles that have that happened some years back. And another case of China is asshole. Ah, <laughs> oh, China, our favorite whipping boy. I'm yeah. do you do you recall the whole do you recall the whole legal battle between Subaraya and Blue Arc? Yeah, I, I, I know a little bit about this, honestly, because yeah, I remember we were we were following this story, especially near the end when oh fuck. And it wasn't until two years ago that they, that they, that, 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 um, Subaraya won. Because, now you, I will, I will try and give the skinny as best I can. You can fill in the blanks with what you, with what you know on the matter, Shades. As I understand it, Blue Arc, which is a, which is a theater production company in China, um, based in, based in Guangzhou, had put out a movie called Dragon Force So Long Ultraman. In, uh, in in 2017, it ran in theaters for a month, which used the Ultraman character and cast and cast him as an et, as an enemy. This was done without any knowledge or or, or approval by Subaraya, and the, and was and Ultraman was on the advertisement for the movie, again without permission, and Subaraya sued. I mean, when has China ever cared about IP rights? Mm -hmm. um, oh, wait, did I say that out loud? Huh. They they sued to try and stop the film screening. Blue Arc went ahead anyways. Then Super I filed a second lawsuit, claiming that it, claiming that it was copyright infringement, largely because it was. In this case, this is one of the few times I will approve of the Japanese copyright uh, courts. Mm -hmm. Um. There was also a case. There was also a case against UMC for li for licensing rights that the that the um, agreement that they had in '76 wasn't valid, which the Ninth Circuit did did de did decide to bet to decide to actually be cooperative. For once, if on if only I could, if only we could have that same level of cooperativeness regarding um, Harmony Gold. Yeah. That's it. That's a different issue, though. That's a different. That's a different discussion. Mm -hmm. But I think it was. A, I think that's. I think that's why for a good for a good chunk of the for a good chunk of the latter end of the Heisei era, there was that emphasis on gimmicks, because lawsuits are expensive, and even with that, they were the amount of damages they were they were awarded only amounted to thirty eight million yen, which is paltry. Well, that's it's nothing. It's less than half a million dollars. Yes, it's nothing compared to, you know, what potential damage uh, China could have done to the Ultra series by casting an Ultra as a villain. A mm. fucking villain! Mm -hmm. Now, that's fortunately, that's fortunately, fine. we've fortunately we've been out of that, and a lot of the, a lot of the distribute, a lot of the distribution in in the states is handled by Mill Creek who 
I'd say have been doing a decent job with it. And oh, that yeah. that brings me to one other thing that's a um a tale of two contrasts. And I'm not the first person to bring this up because our good buddy TJ Omega brought this up as well. And that is a ta- and that is a tale of two western expansions. Ah, yes. <laughs> so both Subaraya and Toei have been making inroads to the west. Mm-hmm. Because well they can Now, Toei who are in who are in their own batch of shit right now, what with the hack and nobody feels oh. any sympathy for them. And when it comes to the when it comes to their inroads, one w- I had initially thought that when they were putting up subtitled episodes of Common Rider on Toku Shoutsu and on YouTube, that may- that maybe they were starting to learn. But like with a lot of things, they went off half cocked. Yeah. Now let me let me give you guys an explanation as to the difference between these two to give you an idea of why Toei bungled this so hard. And I want to explicitly state this was Toei's upper management, and not even Toei Entertainment in regards to a certain name that we normally would bring up. And I'll explain why I say that here in a bit. Because when when Subaraya got the full rights back to Ultraman, even even a little bit before that, when they had some rights to some pre- some certain shows they could release, they were already starting to put stuff up on sites like Crunchyroll. Like they had already, long before Toei had ever stepped into the game, to- uh, Subaraya had already begun putting Ultraman up all over the fucking place. Once they got the full rights, they kind of started moving everything in house and through Mill Creek, mm-hmm. and they went all out. Like, they're putting out full series. More recent stuff is getting released left and right. They're putting stuff up on their YouTube channel. Like, they're putting up full episodes, their entire series, up on their YouTube channel, subtitled, for free. You could go right now onto Super Riot, onto the official Ultraman YouTube channel, and watch Ultraman Z, like we've been doing on Tokuris, legally, for free. Mm-hmm. They are making... Raya. A- and yet you can, st- and yet, and if you're interested, you can go buy the Blu-ray, the DVD or Blu-rays from Mill Creek and support them any way you want. And hey. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that Mill Creek has their own streaming service called Movie Spree. Yeah. But simply put, if you want to watch Ultraman in the West legally, it's not that hard to do. Now, let's compare to that to what Toei's been doing. Now, you can. We won't talk too much about what they've done with Super Sentai because they tried to do that with Shout Factory, with the deal they had during the Neo Saban era. But then once Hasbro took over, that's kind of been in a gray area there. Mm-hmm. Kind of understandable with that. Not great, but not not entirely Toei's fault. But then you look at what they're doing with Common Rider. Like we said, like Monk said earlier. Some of their series, like Kuga, Zero One, and the original Kamen Rider are available, and I think Ryuki just got put up there as well, mm-hmm. are available to watch on Shout Factory TV and Tokushatsu. Outside of that, good luck. You get... They, they, they did do, for a while, having the first two episodes of every Kamen Rider season posted up on their YouTube channel, from the original all the way up through Saber, available to watch. They haven't put up Revice yet, though, which... Rrr. But you could watch the first two episodes of every other season up on there. But outside of the ones I mentioned earlier, you can't watch much of anything else. Most of the movies aren't available except for, like, I think one of the double movies got put back up for a little while. Mm-hmm. And even then, they get taken down very quickly. Like, they go up for a special event, and then they go down, like, a few days later at best. Mm-hmm. And you can't watch anything else. If you want to watch a full season of... Any other season aside from the ones I mentioned, you have to use fan subs. And considering the recent purge they did when uh, some idiot decided to blab about TV Nihon and Overtime and a couple other sites and basically forced Toei to shut them down because legally they had to. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you can't watch. You, you good fucking luck. Mm-hmm. And, and this is... Oh, sorry. I will, I will say that even th- that... 
even with everything that happened with um with T with TV Nihon, there are there are other other groups who have taken up the torch. Yeah. We won't say who, we won't say where to find them because quite frankly, we do not want to be that jackass that fucked that over. Mm -hmm. But it's again not hard to figure that out on your own. However, all this we can is where say bring up what I said or, or Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. This is where I gotta bring up what I said earlier that Normally, there's a name we would be pointing the finger at as to who to blame for this. However, recent uh, comments have actually proven this to be false. Normally, I'd be pointing the finger at our old buddy Shinichiro Shirokura, mm -hmm. a man who has been notoriously a problem when it comes to his production of Kamen Rider and Sentai in Japan. I call him However, the I call him the Jekyll and Hyde of Tokusatsu. Yeah. However, in this particular case. He's he's our Je he's going Jekyll on this one mm -hmm. because someone had asked Shirakura about Toei's expansion to the West, and he himself has shared has shared his regrets that things have not gone the way that he had hoped they would. He is not happy that Toei has fucked over this expansion. Especially, let's also con and I know I'm bringing up something that TJ had brought had brought up before, and but let's also consider the mer the merchandise. End of end of the equation, which you would think you would think would be a you would think would be a priority, especially since you've got a whole you've got a whole host of collectors who would be chomping at the bit to get some of the stuff without having to pay out the ass for international shipping. Let, let me put it this way: <clears throat> even though Toku in general is the only real face of Toku that people have gotten is the Power Rangers adaptations of Super Sentai. There are plenty of fans in the U.S. who would kill to get some of the uh, CSR Deluxe belts from Kamen Rider. And you need look no further than when Connor C.V.A. took Iron Mouse on a virtual walk around in in Japan and went to the fucking common writer store and got her the the revice belt for mm -hmm. right, for her minor cor minor correction there well he did take her to the common writer store he got the belt from a different toy store but your point still stands yeah yes thank you for the correction i i knew that i was going to misquote something <laughs> but but the point is this is a one a vtuber who as we all know from her her background is bedridden Mm -hmm. She doesn't get out much, if at all, anymore. She's actually been going outside to touch grass, literally. And it's been working for her. I'm very happy for her. Mm -hmm. But yes. this is this is the case of someone who has never been to Japan, but knows about Toku enough that she really wanted that fucking belt, and her friend got it for her. Folks. An expansion into the West? That would sell! Like, so fucking bad! Folks, let, 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 let me explain to you, because I actually used a clip of uh, that clip of Connor getting her that revised driver on my video uh, spotlighting Iron Mouse. The reaction she gave when she saw the bell, and more importantly, when Connor made it clear, when Connor bought it for her. If you do, if you watch that clip and you are not in tears of joy seeing her react the way she does. You have no fucking soul. She lost her fucking mind mm -hmm. when it when Connor made it clear he was buying her that belt. She could not believe he would do that for her over a fucking toy belt. On and top of this, Connor is not a is not really big into Toku. He's technically part of Annie tubing only because he's associated with Gigik and Joey, and thus has bad taste. <laughs> they they have or an entire podcast. Say, yeah, I was gonna say, or you could say trash taste. Yeah, they have an entire pod podcast named after their taste, monk. <laughs> oh, um, but the the point is, he doesn't have the investment. He doesn't he he doesn't really get it, mm -hmm. I guess, or maybe he does and just isn't part of it. Mm -hmm. I I, I I'm willing, that, yeah. yeah, I'm willing. It's the latter, but. He still got it for someone who he knew was in it, mm -hmm. because he understands fandom and fan bases, and he understands that a, a good fan base supports each other. Mm -hmm. If they expand into the West, 
situations that are that rare, so rare that somebody is in is in shock and a- a- adulation over getting something that there was no chance in hell of getting prior because of the fact that it was in Japan and importing it would have been impossible. Mm-hmm. You you would see. Tons of merchandise snapped up in an instant. They could backlog all the way to the beginning of Heisei and make gangbusters. And this is what this is why I want to bring up the to- the toy issue frustration because the first, as as TJ pointed out, the first toy, the first bit of merch that was uh, that was um, made of it made available in a U- in a U.S. sense. One would think it would be something like oh oh I don't know a sh figure a sh figure arts thing which is somewhat available but it but through but through a bunch of channels and very difficult to get even nowadays. One would think it might be a a soul of a um a s a um soul a soul thing or even a dx version of a belt. No, it is a it is a fig it is a Rico it is a Common Rider Ichigo black version <laughs> that is just a that is just a statue of Ichigo colored different versions of black because of a because of a relationship that Toei w- has with some sort of label that ha- that has that name that nobody in the states is going to and I'd say a good chunk of people in Japan aren't going to know about and that that's, was that that was their best foot forward. That that's criminal. It very it very much is. Yeah. You you could have you could have put forth even the more simplistic actual child toy like belts that aren't like the big collect again the CSR stuff. Man, the CSR stuff. Or am I saying that wrong? I might you're be saying th- that you're wrong. thinking of CSM, but you're saying CSR. Yes, that one. Thank you. Again. Again, my brain is seventeen places at once right now. But yeah, they could have put for it just, just doing normal the, belts. Yeah, the DX versions. Yeah, a- any any of those any of those that aren't the super collectors editions. If they had just put forth, they could have put forth an actual just Ichigo DX belt from from original Common Rider. Mm-hmm. And there are people here who would have eaten that shit like candy. There, when. Be- when the in- when the Indonesian version of of some of some of the games, especially the Climax series, um, came around, people jumped up. People jumped at the chance to import those. Um, just, um, one of one of them we covered in the past being me- being um, Memory of Heroes. Mm-hmm. Largely because largely because when I look at Common Rider, I'm like, why has there not been a character action game based up- based on this? Um, and I, I especially say that kind of thing with how um, with how Revice has has worked, but there's plenty of others where it could apply just as much. Um, mm-hmm. X8, X8 especially, mm-hmm. although that might be a bit meta because well, X8's whole gimmick is vi- is video games as it is. <laughs> but doesn't doesn't matter. But let me. But in order to in order to elis- in order to illustrate this ki- this kind of thing of how there are of how there are people who would be chomping at the bit to th- to throw to throw legit money at these at these kind of projects. Let's consider the evolution of the of the we- of the Western expansion for New Japan Pro Wrestling in the in the last ten years. In the in the two thousands, there were there of course were U.S. tours here and there, a lot of a lot of which with Ring of Honor, um, and I've told this story in the in the A Legacy of Honor episode I did with Maddie. But one of the big one of the big ca- cases in point was when Kenta Kabashi, one of All Japan and Noah's four pillars of heaven, did a U.S. tour and was going to be working a match with Samoa Joe. Who was st- who was still on his legendary ROH run, and Joe was Joe had told the story about ha- about how in his conversational Japanese that he did know, 
he was trying to talk him out of out of the idea that Kobashi had in his head that he was going to play the evil foreigner heel. He was go he was essentially going to Mister Fu. He felt he had to Mister Fuji it up. And Joe had Joe was kept trying to tell him, no, we're not doing that. Everybody it everybody out there knows who you are. They've been tape trading for years. You're going to be a babyface, and I'm going to do my thing. And it wasn't until they got out. It wasn't until they both got out there that he finally got it. Then let's consider the amount the the um, amount of hype that was generated when two pay per views were going to were going to be joint efforts between Ring of Honor and New Japan, Global Wars and War of the Worlds. And for a lot of people, this was their first foray with New Japan Pro Wrestling. And that and that expanded all that expanded all all the further you started you started to have international international um, crossover stuff, including Chris freaking Jericho showing up at Wrestle Kingdom <laughs> multiple times, and and eventually the, eventually them realizing that the these. That we need to do, we need to do more of these because because you've got a whole audience that that is chomping at the bit for this shit, and the and that and the culmination of that kind of attitude was was doing a whole of a whole event in that in that pyramid arena whose name I whose name currently escapes me in California called Strong Style Evolved. Even getting even the fans understanding the whole Kaze ni Nare, which I listened to the Japanese commentary on that, and they were they were surprised and impressed that the U.S. audience even got it. <laughs> I bring and of course no, of course nowadays New New Japan has has expanded the L, the L.A. dojo and introduced the U.S. Champ, the U.S. Heavyweight Championship as part of their as part of that expansion. Up to and including things like the Windy City Riot event that happened this weekend, and the whole thing with their with their own sub their own sub promotion based on the LA Dojo with New Japan Strong. And I bring that I bring that kind of thing up to de to demonstrate what happens when you give pe when you give people a proper outlet who want to who want to watch or con or consume that stuff in a le in a legal manner and. Obviously, with New Japan, there's a lot of work to be done, but the fact that the fact that inroads are being made it speaks volumes, which is why what Toei has been doing is so confusing and so frustrating. It's a case of if you're gonna if you're gonna do a Western expansion, you can't go off half cocked. And it's also why, when compared to Subaraya and Ultraman, mm -hmm. we see so much more success with Ultra. Um, it, I know that we said we weren't going to bring up details about it all the way at the beginning of the episode, but why do you think an Ultraman anime was created on Netflix? You want to know what's really funny about the Ultraman anime? And I'm not sure if you brought... I don't think you brought up this in your video shades, but this was a case of Toei's loss with Subaraya's gain. Oh, yeah, no, I didn't bring that up, but it totally is. Because... The create the Ultraman and we'll we'll go into this a little bit further, but but I need to give this story for the purposes of context. The Ultraman and the Ultraman anime is based on is based on a manga that was created by the same guy who did Line Barrels of Iron, which is actually pretty good. He did a he did a fan comic that was that was this that was a dark spin on common writer called hybrid inspector which has been fan translated i th i think by i think by gemcorp or or some or somebody else but it but a fan translation does exist and this isn't this is an incomplete fan comic because just as it was starting to get a little bit of um traction toei decided to see and d him and ki and killed and killed the and killed the project off at at its knees despite the fact that fan comics are not fan comics are nothing new and there's i'd say i'd say a lot of companies have a gentleman's agreement to leave fan comics alone even though they could go after them because going at because going after them would be a pr nightmare 
Yeah. And yeah. I don't know what... After that happened, even even after it cooled off and he could have continued it, he decided to not. They. they. It's two people. Yeah, they had, they had decided not to do it. And instead, at some point, they get approached by Subaraya to to do to do something similar. Not in terms of being a darker spin on on Ultra, but do, but their own spin on Ultra. Yeah, because. <clears throat> the uh, the the spin on Ultra there is much different. Uh, I would definitely suggest either reading the manga or again watching the anime. And it provided a new mer it provided a new merchandise angle for Subaraya with the with the suit variants of Ultras. Yeah, yeah. And so, as we can see here, <clears throat> the uh. The way Subaraya has been doing their Western expansion is accessible and in the best way. Free is good. Like, free is really good. Even if, it, not... even if it was just for, even even if it was just for ten for ten or seven or seven bucks a month, like a like a streaming subscription. Oh, the fact the fact that the, the fact that there is an accessible option is. Very, is very much the key. The freeness is just is just icing on the cake, and yeah. it's it um it show. I know what I know. I've brought up that quote from Gabe Newell a lot, and I'm gonna keep uh, bringing it up. Same thing. <laughs> we're all were. Thing. We all were. Yeah. But it is a case. But this is exactly what Gabe was tr was trying to get at with that whole piracy is a service problem, and the way you combat it is by offering a better service. I don't Which, see a whole lot of I don't see a whole lot of Ultraman fan subs these days, largely because there isn't a need for them. At most, I see Ultraman fan subs in non-English languages, um, especially Indonesian. Which is understandable. Um, it's not a market that Subaraya hasn't necessarily looked at expanding into yet. So, translating to other places, other regions. Especially when it's still accessible for free, so I mean it's really easy to get those fan subs out. Is a great way of expanding awareness. Mm -hmm. And as Subaraya has been one to look at this all very favorably and think about how to expand into other markets, they may eventually turn their gazes to other regions too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the and one one addendum i always add to the the new quote is there are always going to be a small sub subset of user assholes who just want their shit for free and don't care mm -hmm. that's yeah. that's society there's a reason that part of overhead costs for physical uh products includes an overhead uh account of, account for theft cuz Realistically, you're not going to stop everybody from stealing. No, There's and it's going to be those people that just do it just for the sake of doing it. And yep. um, even and even if you could, even if you could, it's not worth it's not worth um, it's not worth punishing a thousand legitimate potential consumers just so that you can stop a, just so you can stop ten bad actors. Yeah, and most of the gaming industry still needs to fucking learn, but that's this whole other topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the the the, uh, the big thing is that these these bits of accessibility, especially in like I said, free is good. Like we also pointed out, like Monk pointed out earlier, if you watch these for free and you want to monetarily support these series. These Ultraman series, you can. There are uh, DVDs and Blu-rays available to purchase. This is this is one of the best models for consumption of entertainment media I've seen. And uh, when and new, when new series or new films come out, it there's not a, there's not a very large gap between between um the Japanese release and the international release. And on top of all that, 
it's giving them an inroad for when they want to start throwing more ultra merch this way. Like, can you imagine what sort of merch explosion they could go through very, very soon? Especially given a certain, a certain, pro- a certain project that is go- that is going to bring a lot, bring a lot of eyes to the ultra series. Mm-hmm. I'm re- I'm referring to Hideaki Anno's um, Shin Ultraman. Shin project, Ultraman. Yep. Which I believe is I believe is still in the works. It's the it's one of it's one of the parts of his Shin series because, well, now that he doesn't have to worry about fin- now that the story of Evangelion is du- is pretty much done. Oh, it's done. He doesn't have to he doesn't have to worry about that anymore, and he can focus on other projects, and he doesn't have to worry about Gainax calling him ever again. <laughs> but uh, Shin Shin Ultraman, we can only hope. And I doubt it, but we can only hope that once Toei sees Tsuburaya's uh, success, and it, it, it's going to be successful, we already we were, we're already seeing the burgeoning proof of that the the consumption of of their media, the purchase of the of their DVDs and Blu-rays, the Ultraman anime based off of the Ultraman manga made by uh, Shimizu Eichi and Shimoguchi Tomohiro. Mm-hmm. Uh, all, all of these things are the rumble of the drums in the distance, the calm before the storm. Ultraman is going to sweep the West. It's it's already starting amongst people like us who are already in the know, and and the people that we associate with that may not be in the know. Mm-hmm. Word of mouth started it, but with what Subaraya is doing, it's going to become much wider. Especially if there are, like, I don't know, um, adults our age who have nostalgia for Toku, for, for Power Rangers, and they're looking for something different but in the same vein. Well, they may have heard of Ultraman, at least tangentially. I remember hearing about Ultraman as young as eight. <laughs> uh, and they may go, I wonder what that is. And then they'll be able to look it up. And then they'll be able to watch some of it for free. And then they're going to get hooked. Mm-hmm. And as a as kind as kind of a as kind of a final note as kind of a final case in point with this kind of thing, I'd like to bring up a a article from late December of last year. Rega- regarding the regarding um rega- regarding the plant regarding the plans to grow the Ultraman fan base. The um. The CEO of of Super Eye Productions had said that they plan on growing the fan base without making changes for Western audiences. Because this was this this was an this was um this is now of course this was translated from an from an interview that was on Yahoo Japan. So take so take a, take everything I'm going to say with a grain of salt. But um, Takayuki Sukagoshi had. Has stated, quote, "In order to compete on the world stage, we need to use we need to make use of Japan's identity and Japanese ness as a strong point in our stories." He had, and when he was a, he was asked about whether or not the franchise would be entering a new era of Ultraman that's different from the past, he had said, "We are evolving a different type of Ultraman. What will change is not the form, shape, or form of Ultraman, but the content and nature of the work." It is possible to create a work that has a message that is easy for children to understand, and a universal work that will move and satisfy adults. That's what I'd like to create with Ultraman. However, the details will be announced a little later. In the meantime, we'll continue to produce works other than Ultraman. The future of Super Riot Productions is to use new technologies to create new original works. And... I remember when that article first came out and a bunch of the usual crowd on <clears throat> on a uh, Twitter said the usual stupid things. Mm-hmm. But I also saw this as the snowball. Because just, I think a few days ago, we got a statement from the CEO of Square Enix who said, we can't make good games by imitating Western productions. There was also, um, I think, 
I think there was somebody at JC staff who had all, who had made a who had made similar sentiments of we un we understand we understand that we have that we have a that we have a large Western audience when it comes to our work, but we but we're not cha we're not changing it for them. Yeah, you every you're... every time a uh, a, w a Japanese company has attempted to Westernize in order to appeal to the Western market, it has failed. Yep. Look at, at look at everything that happened in the seventh generation. Crashes and crashes and burns in their face. Mm -hmm. And I think this is actually something that is starting to get through to all of the entertainment media in Japan. Except for maybe Soini, but we won't get into that. <clears throat> um I'm not they, even sure if I can call. So I'm not even sure if I can call Sony a a Japanese company by this point. At least when it comes to their entertainment branch. I mean, yeah. they're owned by a Japanese uh, kabushiki gaisha. So, uh, the 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 note coming across to the larger names in in Japan who have tried to westernize had some experiments that have frankly blown up in their face and uh are now making some of these types of statements are uh are also owned out and and actually demonstrated in some of the lesser companies that have been pra this has been praxis for them for ages um elden ring anybody mm -hmm. the and the fact that Within the Toku world, uh, you know, Subaraya was already pretty adamant in December that no, we're we're going to make Ultraman with the same types of of ideas and values we always have, but you know, new stories, new new content, maybe maybe new you know cinematography or whatever, but it's still going to be. A very very distinct Japanese Ultraman. Mm -hmm. It's going to be that creation. It's been. It's going to continue to carry its roots, and they know that that's going to succeed. They know that that's going to sell like mad because it's already so showing those signs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and here here's the key. Here's why this works. Because if we wanted something that was American, we'd watch American entertainment. We watch stuff like Ultraman because of how different it is from what we get here. So if you try to change it into something that is Americanized, you're just giving us more of what we already are sick of. And so, even if I can use another, if I can use an example that is not Japanese, that's been particularly infamous when it comes to the whole trying trying to trying to appeal to the idea of a certain audience let's consider the doctor who movie ah yes do we really have to remember f that far back <laughs> if we forget someone will try again good point fuck <laughs> and <sighs> That movie was an attempt at a at that movie was BBC's attempt at a western ex, at a American expansion, and it absolutely failed. Um, it's just why Doctor Who went dark for years after that. Well, the reason it went the reason the reason it went dark what is a comp is a, is a complicated issue that has a bit more fa that has a bit more factors. One of them being Michael Grade being an absolute a a grade dick surprising yeah. surprisingly he's the only he's the only he's the only overseer of the bbc that was never knighted can't imagine why <laughs> neither, neither. by the way uh real quick sidebar it was set, uh, related thing i just put pop it on youtube for the hell of it uh apparently we didn't catch this but this just dropped literally 10 hours ago okay let's see what we got I 
Okay, what you am I looking at? this shit better if you tried! <laughs> That's Shin Ultraman's official uh, trailer. Yeah. And an, an announcement date. 513. Monk. Monk, you couldn't tie this better if you fucking tried! <laughs> <laughs> And here we have it, people. Go and look at the Tsuburaya Productions Ultraman official channel on YouTube, and you will now see a trailer for Shin Ultraman, mm -hmm. which is coming out on May 13th. Um, missed opportunity. They should have delayed it by six days. God damn it! God damn it! <laughs> You're lucky Maddie's not here. He would go freaking hog wild over that. <laughs> Don't think I didn't catch that. Oh, I know. That's why I did it. Fucking <laughs> Christ. But you can you can see Yes, this is a this is a Japanese channel, but they have plain English mm -hmm. in the in the actual channel name. So it's easier for Western audiences to fucking find. Yeah. They like... know the West is watching! Mm-hmm. And in, st in the in that si in that si this is also why I brought why I brought up the Western expansion with P with Puro Resi because you I've been I've been seeing I've been seeing other um, after the success of new of what New Japan has been doing over the last decade I have been seeing other promotions trying to trying to make inroads you have. Um, you have Noah work. You have Noah working with it. You have Noah working with Impact, as well as um, as well as more recently, um, DDT is working with AEW, which is gonna be is gonna be interesting. I hope I hope that some people who, I hope that this means that some of the interesting pay per views that DDT has put out will get will get shown to Western audiences, if only so they can see how batshit crazy DDT is. <laughs> <laughs> just re just remember, yo. Just remember, Yoshiko is tech. Yoshiko is technically a ch no. Yoshihiko is technically a champion. Is technically a champion, and it's a and that is a blow up doll. <laughs> He's not kidding, folks. Well, a lat a ladder won a championship twice. I mean, ladders are dangerous, though. Mm -hmm. and of course, need we bring up the the, the family of wrestling pandas? <laughs> but they're got... they're so wholesome they win championships without doing anything. Yeah, you've got you have you have that you have um, beat um big Japan wrestling and and all Japan making making their own inroads and being and being very active on their on their Western accounts. And with e and with each of those, there isn't a desire to to try to try and fix to try and adjust what they're do what they're doing. People people know that people know what they're doing, and that's the reason why they're watching. Um, people who people who would be watching death matches with BJ, with BJW or even FMWE, they're watching because they know because they know how batshit crazy death matches get in Japan. I mean, you only have to watch the second episode of Cal Gygar to see how crazy the <laughs> death matches in Japan get. I had to make that joke. That yeah, joke was, was obligatory. Yeah, you did. His name is Death Bomber, for Christ's sake. Oh, uh, that... That's... T that is tame. Especially... Get I didn't even get to bring up the piranhas. <laughs> but... I think I think the best point here, not just about Japan, but about anyone making inroads into uh, the U.S. and into the Western markets, mm -hmm. keep your identity, be who you are, do not change for the market you're going to, because that's not what the market wants. You or guys, at least know, not any. You guys know that I'm a big I'm a big fan of um of in of the thick of it and in the loop. Mm-hmm. Mostly because of Malcolm Tucker, mm -hmm. um, the guy who cr the guy who created that series did at one point try and make it, try and um, do a pilot 
for an American version of a of a Malcolm Tucker. It did not work. It didn't work. It did not work. Mm-hmm. It did. It didn't even. It didn't even get picked up. And apparent. Apparently, he said in hindsight that the that that pilot sucked. Yeah. So instead, instead of instead of trying to instead of trying to do, instead of trying to do the same the same sort of the same sort of humor that he, the same sort of style that he did with the thick of it. Instead, he de- he decided to lean more into a a sat a satire of. Of of political offices with American politics, and we got the HBO series Veep out of that, which had 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 its had its fair share of of bite of biting wit, but it wasn't. Tr- but it was something that f- it was something that felt like a American take on on that kind on that kind of biting wit instead of a British um, style of wit trying to be American. So that that's a good example of that whole keep of that whole keep your identity. Yeah. And with that respect, we go back to uh Tsuburaya's announcement about how they're not going to change for a western audience in December. Mm-hmm. And now we have an anchor point to see why Ultraman is consistently nostalgic. Yes. And they keep their identity. Mm-hmm. And I will, cer- I will certainly be keeping. In, I will certainly probably be watching Shen Ultraman and and Chron- and Chronicle D when the- when those come around, or at the very least, keeping a pa- a passive eye on things. Although um, I will, I will admit that th- when it came to me getting into Zet, they had they had a very strong case. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, I wasn't even trying for that. I was more—I was more going for the fact that they that they brought that they brought in Masaki Endo, the the heir to Kageyama's throne, to handle the opening. Oh, that opening is so fucking glorious! Mm-hmm. Oh, I wouldn't exactly call Endo the heir to Kageyama's throne, considering they both sing together. It, I I was being somewhat facetious because it it definitely felt like it, like Endo was was being trained to be the to be the flag bearer for Jam Project after after um Kageyama was get, was starting to wind down. I mean, they all look really old these days, and I'm very sad about it. <laughs> they are really starting to hit that point where they need new blood. Mm-hmm. But that's that's a that's a story for another day, and I'd only co- I'd only cover that story if we can some if we can somehow get a translation of the documentary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if there's a fan sub of that. I can go find out. But that but I think that I think that about covers it when it comes to this exploration of um, Ultraman. Now, ne- now over the over the course of this week, there will be a, there will be a few interesting things that we'll, that we'll be doing, um, in, up to and including, I, I believe, I believe, actually, no, no, that's not, no, that's not the case quite yet. Um, but I will be having a few. I will be having a few in, a few interviews. In the in the coming days, um, along with along with the the sec the second part to what we to what we handled with Veil of the Void last Friday, just remember, folks, use code Two Monks to get ten percent off your purchase of Veil of the Void. And ne- and next week. We will we'll be delving in we'll be delving into into something a little a little more design hat y because I because technically speaking we didn't do a single reconstruction in April. So we'll do so we'll be doing something close enough. But that is a story for another day. So until then 
On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch.